everyone is only one heartbeat away from taking their last breath and stepping into eternity. And a great number of people will have no warning when that happens. They will not know in advance. Some will, and I don't know if that's better or worse. But I was reading a couple weeks ago something that really impacted me and it kind of stuck with me and I I knew that I would probably bring it up in one of these messages but I remember exactly where I was when I saw the space shuttle Challenger blow up 73 seconds after lifting off from Cape Canaveral Florida in 1986 and it killed all seven astronauts that were aboard at that time I I had not moved up to Minnesota yet. I was still living in Iowa and I was living a reckless partying lifestyle all day, all night. It was a reckless lifestyle. And I remember exactly where I was laying on this couch, watching TV, just no, not even really focused on this event, but I saw it explode in the air and I thought, Wow, that, I knew it was live. I knew that the astronauts that were in that shuttle were not coming back. That's what I knew. I could tell that was the end of their lives. And that visual stopped me in my tracks, which was very hard to do back then because I didn't even know if I had tracks, to be honest. I was so reckless. But it stopped me, and I can still see that visual in my mind's eye. That shuttle broke apart into a fiery explosion at 46,000 feet. And that crew included a Iowa. teacher, Christina McAuliffe, whose students were actually watching this on television. And in a transcript from the crew's voice recorder, pilot Michael J. Smith's last words were, uh-oh, before all data was lost. The pieces some of the parts that, ap that blew off, including the crew cabin, continued to go up, reaching an altitude of 65,000 feet before it fell into the Atlantic Ocean. The part that really captivated me was, because I've heard all that information before, but the seven crew members of that space shuttle probably remained conscious after that explosion on January 28th, and they had switched on at least three emergency breathing packs, according to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA made public the information showing that the Challenger crew probably did not, they probably not only lived through the blast, but they understood the seriousness of the situation enough to activate emergency air systems. Dr. Joseph Kerwin, Director of Life Sciences at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston said, the explosion that tore the crew compartment from the rest of the orbiter probably would not have killed or even seriously injured the crew members. Medical analysis indicates that these accelerations are survivable and that the probability of major injury to crew members was very low. When asked if he meant that the crew probably remained conscious for at least 10 seconds, he replied, yes. But the cabin hit the water surface at more than 200 miles an hour in two minutes and 45 seconds after the shuttle broke apart. And at that point, they would not have survived. The impact was so great to the ocean that they would not have survived, but they could have survived all the way up to that point. He noted at the press conference that he could not rule out the possibility that they may have been alive when the crew cabin hit the water nearly intact, but that no one survived the impact. So I think that really kind of jarred me because I thought, what would you do if you knew you're just flying downward? You don't have any idea. You just, what do you do with that two hours and 45 min seconds? Two minutes and 45 seconds because I think about things like that. I never used to think about things like that, but I compare it to not anything close to that, but I was in a car accident in November of 2008. 
I was on I-94 going to, I don't remember where I was going, but I was on the freeway going to St. Cloud when the brake lights of the vehicle in front of me came on and we were, everyone was going the speed limit and there was two lanes of freeway, but there was cement barriers on both sides. I just still don't know why, because I can't locate this same spot, but there was some kind of construction going on right at that area that there was cement barriers that you could not see over. And I thought I was on a bridge, but everyone told me there's no bridge there. So there was some kind of construction. But I remember knowing that this was a moment that I was never going to forget because right beside me was a semi and I'm between a cement wall and a semi and the brake lights are on in front of me. I tapped my brake because I knew that I was going to hit the car ahead of me and then I realized why he had hit his brake lights because we were all on black ice. And at that point, when I tapped my brake, I started to turn to the right. And all I remember looking at is I'm going right underneath the trailer of a semi. Oddly, we came to the end of the barriers about the same time. And I either was hit or I hit one of the tires of the semi. And it sent me spinning so fast I was just spinning and I remember the feeling of spinning and I thought I, I mean your mind is just blank like I, I can gather what's happening at every step I remember it well but it's like there's nothing I can do absolutely nothing there's no way this is gonna end up good for me I stopped because my car smashed backwards into another vehicle that was already in the median. Other vehicles had shot all the way across and had stopped the traffic on the other side. So 94 coming eastbound was already shut down because cars had flew into their lanes from this same spot. But when I hit this car backwards, it I was going so fast that it smashed in the whole back of the car so the whole trunk was flat and it smashed it up against the back seats the or the front seats so there was no back seat left of the car but then the seats flew back so the seats were back flat it was shocking that I I just kind of look and I'm done spinning and the car is has no glass left and I'm just sitting there looking around. I can't see it because I'm spinning. And then someone runs over to me and grabs me and yanks me out of the car really fast. They said, there's cars coming into the ditch. And they yanked me out really fast out the window because other cars were smashing into the cars that were in the ditch. And I just remember sitting there just watching all these cars fly off the road. And I, it was hard to, it was hard to believe. But I will tell you that from the moment I saw those brake lights until everything was all done and they had shut down all the freeway lanes, I was not thinking about anything except what's happening right out of, that my eyes are trying to understand. There wasn't my whole life played in front of me. There wasn't, oh no, what if I'm not saved? There was nothing like that. I was computing what my eyes were seeing. And there was no chance at that moment that I would have had the wherewithal to even think about what's undone, what kind of um, situation am I going into. It was, it was, there was <laughs> nothing like that happening. And I don't know if that's the case for everyone. I'm sure depending on what the what the event is that causes that but in my case it was blank i was watching it unfold going this is probably the end for me the bible repeatedly warns us not to wait until the last minute and for me i realized just how that came i was given a gift first of all of surviving this terrible accident but i was also given a gift of this is how fast this can go down and you have no there's no chance you can control it 
We don't know what the future holds. Life is uncertain and we can be gone in an instant. And this doesn't matter if you know and love Jesus or not. This is part of what happens when you are a human being on this planet. And when there's people who feel that I'm going to wait until I know that I'm at the end before I repent, most of them do not get that chance. And why would you think your repentance would be true when you waited until the last moment to express that you were sorry for your sin? That decision actually to wait and wait and wait shows the exact opposite actually, and it shows the truth about you. That your repentance is not that you hate your sin or know that you're guilty before God, or if you do know you're guilty before God, you're not as concerned about it as you are about what's about to happen to you because of it. It shows that you want to avoid the penalty because you're being cornered right now and you know you need to act to avoid the penalty that you justly deserve. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Do not ever assume on God's grace and don't treat Christ's death on the cross so lightly because the one who grants you salvation does not treat Jesus' death on the cross lightly at all. And that's what this is around, is Jesus death on the cross as to when you repent or not if you don't want to follow Jesus Christ right now why would you want to spend eternity with him and try to secure that when you're making a decision that I'm not going to get to sin anymore now I need to get right with God the Bible makes it clear that God loves us with an everlasting love and he stands ready to forgive anyone who genuinely turns to Christ in repentance and faith. Second Peter 3 9 says he's patient with you not wanting anyone to perish but everyone who comes to repentance. One of the two criminals who was crucified with Jesus turned to him in faith only hours from death and he was saved according to the Bible in Luke 23 40 to 43 and this can happen but it rarely happens. The Bible also warns that when we repeatedly turn away from God we can reach a point of no return. And this isn't because God won't forgive us. It's because every time we say no, or we rebuff the goodness of God, our hearts grow colder and colder and colder, harder and harder and harder due to our love of sin. But pretty soon, we don't even feel the conviction. We've become so callous. We're not even sensitive to hear his voice. And oftentimes people feel, I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven because they're too cold and too callous to even know the truth. They just feel they are entitled to heaven at that point. The other criminal who was crucified with Jesus showed contempt towards him at the end. And this is a warning against a heart that has become callous because people feel entitled to certain things when that happens with something so great as salvation that costs so much that is a dangerous position to be in and a lot of times that doesn't happen to people who don't know about god it happens to those who do the ones who have forsaken 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 and continued to go one more day one more day one more day if you plan to come to jesus in this life I would definitely not wait because God knows every time you say no, he's very well aware of every time and why that Jesus isn't enough, that you want something more. Satan always whispers some other time, one more day. Tell your unsaved boyfriend or girlfriend that you will bring them to Christ, bring them to church, but if you get saved right now, they are going to leave you and then they will end up going to hell because you won't be in their life. He comes up with all kinds of crafty ways to make you think you're doing the right thing by waiting one more day. And many wrongly think that after living a life of sin and pleasing themselves, actually sin is pleasing yourself, not living according 
starting to God's direction for your life and you building your own kingdom, your own life instead of his own. That is what sin is. That is what living a life of sin is. It isn't always being a raging alcoholic or a criminal. Sometimes it is a person who is high up in the church or a ministry, but they live according to their own plans. Even though it looks like they're living according to God's plans, they are not. There's far too many people that feel that they can repent on their deathbed at the last minute, just in the nick of time in order to be saved. But I wanna show you some problems with that plan. What would cause a person to genuinely repent at the last minute anyway? Repentance is a change of heart produced by godly sorrow for one's sin. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation, a repentance which brings no regret, but the sorrow of the world works death. A person who waits until the last minute to repent is motivated not by godly sorrow, but by the fear of death and hell for eternity. They comprehend that the end is near. They're suddenly terrified by the prospect of dying, and they know they're lost. And they finally admit that they can't defy God any longer. And so they give in, but not to repentance. They give in to feeling sorrow because they can't stay outside of it any longer. They feel and go to heaven. We also know that in every one of the judgment parables spoken by Jesus, someone is condemned for good things they left undone, not for any bad things they did. Doing bad things is certainly not tolerated in the kingdom, but avoiding wrongdoing is not the point or the way to focus on salvation. That's religion. Religion is what God hates. It's what he was always yelling at the Pharisees about. It is man's choices driving the relationship, and that is completely against God. The practice of religion misses the love and intimacy desired by God and it is not present if someone waits until death to chance repentance in describing who will enter the kingdom of heaven Jesus did not say whosoever does not disobey my father will be saved but he says whosoever does the will of my father in Matthew 7 21 obedience is positive as well as negative. And in the great judgment scene of Matthew 25, Jesus pronounced condemnation, not upon those who did evil things, but upon those who failed to do the good things that he had created them to do, even unto the least of these. He says in Matthew 25, 45, how can a person undo a life of inactivity and absent of good deeds how can they resolve that with a deathbed repentance? They cannot. It is not impossible with God. I am not going to assume that this can't happen, but it's going to be tough if a person has denied Jesus over and over and over through life to secure a spiritual conversion right before they die. Waiting until the end of your life to obey the gospel robs a person of a lifetime of plans and purposes that God had for them before they would be brought to heaven, but instead they chose to do none of them. They chose to not even come into a relationship with him. They robbed him of every single day of their life. And this also robs others of the godly example they could have set, the influence they might have had for Jesus here on earth. They completely selfishly robbed everyone, including themselves. And yet they want the right to have what is due to someone who didn't do any of those things. How can a person repent of their sin on their deathbed if repentance requires making restitution, repayment, and other amends? John the Baptist told the multitudes who were coming to be baptized to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance in Luke 3, 8. But how can someone do that when they're dying? How can someone be baptized on their deathbed? The Bible speaks of baptism as a burial in water for the remission of sins, and the word itself means a complete dipping or immersion. And choosing to distance ourselves and remain separate from obedience and leading others to Jesus in hopes that we will suddenly be able to change it at the end 
is the exact opposite of sound thinking. It is the exact opposite of the written will of God. And some point to the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, Matthew 20, as proof that people may postpone obedience until their deathbed, but that's in error because in that parable, when they were called, each person went immediately to work. They were called and they went. That's different from a person who is called and refuses and refuses and refuses until the last minute. Very different story. Others point to the thief on the cross who was saved at the last minute. But by all biblical reasons, he was possibly under the old law because Jesus was still alive. We know nothing about his prior life or his acts of obedience before the cross. It's not a good comparison either because there's no real, we don't know the details around that. So don't wait until some future opportunity because in most cases, it does not come. Don't put off until tomorrow what God has commanded you to do today. Hebrews 3.13 says, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and you miss your eternal salvation. Forgiveness is the centerpiece of the gospel. It is one half of the gift God offers through the cross, but the other half is an invitation into the fullness, the healing, and all the blessings that God has prepared for us in this life. Repentance is how we receive that gift. To repent means to make a conscious decision to change behavior away from disobedience towards obedience to God. Repentance frees us up to be more joyful and to live as created. And then the act and the fruit of repentance, which is something God works out in us, cuts off the destructive behaviors that cling tightly and keep us stuck and captive to sin. Repentance actually loosens us from those things. And in the Bible, repent means to turn away from something that offends a good, holy, loving, and wise God. We do this not because God will send us to hell if we don't, but because offending a good and loving God is not a good decision. It's not life-giving. It's not sensible for any wise person to do. To repent means to make a genuine choice to make our life here on earth an offering pleasing to God every day. We are no longer our own. We are his. He gave his life for us. We are expected to give ours for him. True repentance releases us from shame and guilt that influence our choices and our behaviors. Anything that sends our life away from God, genuine repentance will stop that. But for real repentance to happen, there has to be a willingness to put to death our self-centered ways and wants. And Jesus very likely meant that when he advised his friends, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must take up his cross and follow me. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry or I did it. It can be that, but that's not the act of repentance. There's a real invisible change in values proven by a character shift that happens after we repent. It shows that we left one kingdom focused on self to become part of another kingdom which seeks to honor and please Jesus. And we become free when we do that, but not free to do whatever we please. To think otherwise is to completely miss the point of the true community that God seeks to build. Those who lead are those who serve in obedience and humility. The Bible says a few things about that moment, that end. Ecclesiastes 9, 11 through 12 says, again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. For a man does not know his time, like a fish, like fish that are taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Proverbs 27, one says, do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring. James 4, 13 through 15 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist 
that appears for a very little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Matthew 6, 33 to 34 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Luke 12, 20, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Ecclesiastes 9, 11, or 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2, working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in favorable time, I listened to you and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And Ecclesiastes 12, 7 tells us what happens to a person when they die. It says, then they shall, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. In other words, when a person dies, his or her spirit will go back to God where it came from, and the body goes back to dust where it came from, and the soul will no longer exist. The requirements of repentance are knowledge of your sin, knowledge of sin, what, actually what is sin, because many people will say to me that's not sin, but in the Bible it says what is sin and it's not up to us to decide what's sin and what's not. Also, knowledge that you have sinned against God, knowledge that you have broken God's law, knowledge that the punishment for breaking God's law is death, knowledge that you are guilty of breaking God's law and deserve death, Knowledge that God has provided a way for you to escape that punishment. Knowledge that the way God provided for you to escape that punishment is through Jesus, his son, being punished in your place. God also granting permission for you to repent. You accepting the substitutional death of Jesus in your place and making a decision to reject sin, to turn away from it and turn towards God. And for someone to ask the question about, will I have time to repent before I die, puts you in a category that should terrify you because you, by saying the question, you have already acknowledged that you need to repent, that you have considered the decision because you know you need to do it before you die. And by your own confession, you have been given that chance to repent right then and there. So the possibility of you dying before you have a chance doesn't even exist anymore. You just had it. The only possible way a person can die before they have a chance to repent is if they are completely ignorant of what sin is, of Jesus, of God. They know nothing about it. That's the only way someone would not have a chance before the moment they meet Jesus. So you can ask the question then, it's too late for you if you have already decided no. It's not too late for you if you decide, this is foolish that I'm waiting. This is complete foolishness because most who do don't get the chance and you are not being offered another one because you already know you've been offered many. Repent today. Today is the day of salvation, God says. In all of his kindness and his mercy, he is saying, please repent today. I don't want you going to hell. I don't want you gambling with eternity. People are so careful with um, investing their money, with um, decisions about their family, but they are so reckless with this choice. It's crazy. This life is a blip. That life is forever, but people spend zero time trying to figure out how to make that one the one that they are actually building. What happens after death depends on one single choice that you make during your life. And once you die, you can't undo anything. It's all done. There's no reincarnation. There's no way that you go sit in this medium place and your family can buy you out. There is none of that. You don't get to come back. You don't get to do it over. You don't get a second chance after death. 
while you were living, you had many, many chances. And if any of us are honest, we know that. We will admit that, and we sure will admit it in front of God. If you choose to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross to save you from the consequences of your sin, and you turn from serving self to serving Jesus, you will receive eternal life. You will go to heaven to be with him forever, where it's bright, it's amazing, it's eyes cannot even, we, there's no way to, to compare it to anything that we know. God raised Jesus from the dead, and if we are followers of Jesus, he's going to raise us too. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. It is so constant and clear throughout the word that God is begging. He is begging everyone to not go to hell. He didn't make it for humans. He made it for the devil. So it's not going to be anyone standing in front of God at the end saying they were they had a poor chance or they didn't know or he wasn't fair at that moment when your entire life and all of your words are played out in front of you you won't have any defense if you choose not to believe and follow Jesus there's one place where the Bible says you, you that it's by omission the default place hell with the devil and his angels. You will be condemned to loneliness, separation, never ending regret, and a lake of eternal fire. It's heaven or hell, life or death, follow Jesus or destruction. And if you have chosen Jesus, your spirit leaves your body when you die and it goes to heaven. And on the day of judgment, God doesn't display all of your sin to remind you what he saved you from. Jesus suffered the judgment and punishment for all of your sins, it's gone, wiped away. God sees you as cleansed by the blood of Jesus. You are forgiven, your sin is gone. It's God's gift of grace, not earned by any good works that you have done on earth. I don't care how big of a ministry you build, you don't deserve it any more than the man who murdered someone and is in prison for the rest of his life. But your name is written in the book of life if you have given your life to Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. There isn't a single one of us that deserve it. You won't be judged, but you will be evaluated if you are a follower of Christ for your faithfulness and the things you've done that have eternal value. It will not be about any material success on this earth. You'll receive rewards for only what you allow Jesus to do through you. So these are things that he orchestrated, that he chose, and you said, here I am, send me. That's what you will be rewarded on and your position in heaven will be based on. Nothing we know can compare to the joy of being with God in heaven, which is too beautiful for words. We will receive a new body just as Jesus was, resur was resurrected, so we also will be given a resurrected body. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44 says, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was the same, but he was different. His body functioned outside the limits of space. He was able to appear in a room without even entering it. And yet he ate and mingled with his disciples in that room like he was there. He was there. His hands and his feet showed the holes from the nails of the cross, but he was alive and he was not in pain. His body was fully healed. But if you've rejected to live for, obey, and exalt Jesus with your life here on earth, if you refuse that offer to be freed from your sin, you'll stand before God's great white throne and be condemned. You will be rejected, 
because you rejected Jesus. That's why you will be condemned. Not God's choice, it's your choice. It will make no difference that you now realize that that was a terrible mistake. You will desperately desire to be with God at that moment, but you never will be. It's too late by then. The book of Revelation says that anyone whose name is not written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. So it had to be written in there before you ended up in front of God. Thrown into the lake of fire is a choice you made this side of death. And I am shocked at how many people joke about that. They clearly have no idea. It's worse than if you, we see in, in the last few years, there's been these big volcanic eruptions and you just see that molten lava just pouring down the sides. Imagine going up and throwing one of your children into that river of fire pouring down. That's, if you have not led your children to God and to understand how critical salvation is, that's what will end up happening to them. We are all responsible for each other and a lake of fire should serve as enough motivation for us to be very focused not on what sports they're in, how good they're doing in school. I would say keeping them out of a lake of fire should be, for eternity, should be the number one choice that you make every single day of the life that God gave you. And if it's not your children like me, then it should be the people around you. You should love them enough to try to keep them out of hell because there's far too many in positions that are ministry positions that are teaching something so false that people sit there and think they're just entitled to heaven. It's a narrow road. The Bible's clear that few are going to find it. You want to make sure you're teaching the truth because you are given a much deeper place in hell if you don't. Though we may die, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John eleven twenty five. 25. We will receive immortality, immorality when, immortality when Jesus comes again. And the Bible says that all those who have died, both righteous and wicked, will be raised to life in one of two resurrections. The righteous will be raised to life at Jesus' second coming, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. The wicked are raised to life in a separate resurrection, the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus said, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear my voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. James 5, 28 and 29. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, also believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 and 54 says, For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. God never intended that physical life would go on forever in this temporary flesh body that we have and to the contrary he tells us that sooner or later we're all going to die it is appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment hebrews 9 27 solomon said to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven a time to be born a time to die ecclesiastes 3 1 through 2 human life at its best is mortal and temporary here today gone tomorrow and when compared to eternity, even 70 or 100 years is a flash of light. It's a flash. Look at it in reverse. The deep pains of suffering through heartbreak, they can be very hard to endure. But the blinking of an eyelash compared to the vast span of eternity ahead, the apostle.
Apostle Paul wrote, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a, a far great, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Someone once said, eternity is like a small bird flying over to the coast of California, dipping its beak in the water and filling its beak, flying all the way back across the United States to the ocean on the other side and dropping that water in that ocean and then flying back over to the other side, California, and getting a beak full of water and taking it all the way across and dropping it in on the other side. By the time that bird has emptied out this ocean into this ocean, eternity will just be starting. That's a time more time comparable than anything else I've heard. God has given each of us life. God gave us life. God created and gave us life. And that life has been redeemed by the life of Jesus. There is so much wrong with our lives. Jesus paid it all. Our life belongs to God because we came from him. He loves us with an unending love and he's always concerned about the details of our life here and our eternal destiny. No matter how far out we get from him, I am one who can say, I am amazed at the mercy of God. God will allow only what is best for us according to his wisdom and eternal plan. And if he allows tragedy, sometimes untimely death to occur, we can trust in God that it will serve a good and rightful purpose in his plan that encompasses eternity. I can say that in my life, I'm kind of shocked at some of the things that happened, but I never once blamed God, even when I was lost. I never once blamed God. I knew it wasn't God's fault that these things were happening to me. I knew that I fully put myself in positions to have some very bad things happen to me. But I'm surprised how many people blame God. They blame God for the way their parents treat them. They blame God for how their aunts and uncles molested them. They blame God for all these different things that God had nothing to do with. The only way for us to get free is to go to God and get all that cleaned off and let him deal with the people who harmed us because he will. It will all come out. But why we would think to blame God for anything that goes on down here is it just shows how back to showing contempt. The second thief on the cross and the contempt that he showed for God. Many people are doing that today. They blame God for death. God did not author death. They blame God for um, we've completely destroyed our earth with all kinds of different things. And yet God gets blamed every time something goes wrong with the earth. God is blamed for. I've seen God blamed for more things that than anyone really a person who really truly knows God and the character of God, it just makes, it's mind boggling that people would keep these judgments against God. The only one who does love us, the only one who can free us, the only one who has made any steps towards blessing us when we deserve nothing. We have done nothing to deserve it. But he does say all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose in Romans 8 28 and I'm living in the blessing of him turning many of the worst things that happened to me and the grief the betrayal all the rejection as a result of that and all of those things I wouldn't be who I am today I wouldn't be able to make some of the choices I'm able to make today because it made me so much more resilient than I would have been. I also know how good God is and that if anything terrible does happen to me, which it easily could, that he will turn it for my good. And when he does that, and I look back at everything that's happened, it is well worth it. 
whatever he's allowed, even my own doing, what he has done with it since, it is well worth it. I'm called to Kingdom Army. Focus. I want everything to be used. And he doesn't use how bright I am. He doesn't use how gifted in art I might be. He doesn't use any of that. He uses the wreckage that he retrieved, that he made new, that he rewrote. He uses that. He's the artist. That's what he uses. First John 3.20 tells us that God knows all things. He's acquainted with every pain and every sorrow that we have. Psalm 103.14 says, For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. So when sickness comes, God is certainly able to heal the human body of any disease. He can remove any type of affliction or hardship. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, O oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for you. But many faithful Christians have died, some in great pain, because God did not heal them this side of heaven. And there are some possible reasons why. And only God knows the hearts of each individual person and acts with each one to accomplish his will, which we will not understand this side of heaven. And the reasons show why God would permit death among his people and their loved ones. He will allow some to die when their purpose has been fulfilled, when they fulfilled the, whatever it is that he wanted from them and that their life's work is done. God has chosen to take them and Paul's own life is a testimony of this truth. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Wow. To one who had just a miserable experience as a Christian, always beaten, jailed, prisoned, shipwrecked, no one knows when one's purpose is completed, but God knows. Some die because of their lifestyle habits or the breaking of just health laws. They do not live long because of gluttony or malnourishment, disease that comes on through diet choices, unsanitary living. Some of us know that if you do not take care of a uh, if you have a tooth that is needs a filling and you don't, don't do it, you can die from that. So not taking care of this temple can actually result in an early death. Harsh living conditions, people can, in just natural conditions, heat or too cold. There are so many factors that that can cause someone to die. Some people actually work themselves to death. And God can also withhold healing because a person will not turn from these choices. So I look at sugar as being one of the choices that many people will not turn from. My husband was diagnosed stage four cancer in 2007. And that, that's a lot to hear. And I started to look at a lot of different things about cancer and I was just refusing to accept what I was hearing and I found out that the test to locate cancer is sugar based and that sugar feeds cancer it's cancer food it certainly affects whether you're alkaline or not and I talked to some people about that and they said that sugar addiction not only is a major part of cancer, but it's a major part of a lot of other sickness and disease, but people want their sugar. My husband is very healthy right now, so I'm very grateful that I paid attention to all fronts, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. We took great care to cover all things, and I stayed away from people who gave me 
um, dreadful responses to things. I made sure the only people around us were those who knew that God could heal and that God would work a miracle. And the rest, I shut them out until I, the, until we were past the crisis. But I will say that a few years later, someone I worked with, who I, I thought the world of, I, I worked with this guy, and he was diagnosed with um, it was cancer. It was in his, it was in his spine. There was a couple other places that he had this cancer, a pretty serious diagnosis. And so he asked to meet and we met with him and he wanted advice on how to live because people know that my husband was in, he wasn't in remission yet, but he was certainly doing a lot better. So we met with him and when we told him he had to cut out all sugar from his diet, he was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. He said, do you know how much I love sugar? I said, well, I mean, you can keep eating sugar, but it's going to keep feeding your cancer. And he just said, you know, if I'm going to die, I want to be able to eat sugar. And that was the end of it. He didn't want to hear anymore. And he did die. I don't think he lived another year, but he certainly kept eating the way he wanted to. That's everyone's personal choice. But it goes back to this, that if you serve gluttony, that you serve um, something that it just my alcoholism back when when you live on something that is so poisonous to your system that it breaks down your liver your pancreas if you want to make those choices and keep destroying your own body we should not expect healing from God because we all know better he isn't expected to write deliberate wrong choices. He can, but we should not be angry when he doesn't. And as a living testimony, he will allow death so that his work may increase and grow. And Hebrews 11 talks about people who died in the faith, being beaten, whipped, slaughtered for the cause of God, but their lives help to shape the destiny of others more than anything else. And it will, they will hear that Christianity thrives the most in persecution. These people in Hebrews were a dramatic testimony. They were like Jesus before their persecutors. They were full of faith and courage and they trusted their God. It shows a belief in something far greater than anything this world has to offer. When people are being torn apart, they're being burned at the stake when they stand in those circumstances as a brilliant witness to the world that they are not afraid and they know where they're going. They are going to receive the highest heavenly reward and they will shine forth with great glory in the kingdom of God because they truly did lay down their life. God will also allow death to serve as a test for the living. When Job's family was taken from him by Satan, even though he didn't understand why God allowed it, he remained faithful to the end. And when you see loyal Christians die from sickness, accidents, even persecution, it draws attention to them. People start to wonder about God when they have such a great attitude and they're so, um, they're just pouring out light and hope when they themselves, their body is dying. And this is a test that some of us may face. God doesn't make mistakes and he's without sin, but he is in control and he does test those he loves to make us perfect. So if he allows that, it's for a much greater reason that he plans to accomplish and we should never doubt it. We may not see it this side of heaven, but on the other side, we will see why. A supreme final test is one of the other reasons God allows death. And that's probably one of the most significant when one is willing to forego his life for whatever God chooses or for whatever purpose it serves in his work. He has passed the greatest earthly test. There is not one greater. Jesus said, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake will find it, Matthew 16, 25. And when you give your life to Jesus, you have to ask, did I give my life to Jesus to be used any way he chooses to use it? 
or did I give my life to Jesus but retain the right to do my life the way that I want? And if yours is the latter, the truth is you did not give your life to Jesus. You're living in deception because truly giving your life to Jesus means it's up to him what happens. So if you really meant that you gave your life to Jesus, then you follow what he tells you to do. We're kingdom builders. We're not of this world, but we're in it. We're ambassadors for the king here. Your life should radiate Jesus Christ to all of those around you. And sometimes God will use the fire of tragedy to mold us into weapons against the enemy for an eternal purpose that he has ahead that we don't see coming, but we can trust him. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 7. We must realize that our lives are a vapor and our true hope lies only in God. All of this life will melt away and death takes us to a realm where earthly wealth has zero it has no value the saddest deception to fall into this side of heaven is to focus on earthly wealth fame only to realize at the end that everything of self is burned up and we're penalized for it death cannot overrule the power of God and upset his plan it cannot snatch us from God before he's decided what time. The righteous do not fear death. They have confidence they will live as long as they're supposed to live, and they will serve God's purpose until that happens. So as long as you're walking with God, no one can take you from his love or care. Satan has absolutely no authority over believers. He cannot harm them or hurt them without God's permission. We are protected. The only time God allows that is to rut out sin that's in our life or to accomplish, again, a greater purpose that we may not know at the time. Death won't come earlier than God says it will. And when God does determine to allow you die, if you are a follower of Jesus, it's because he knows you're ready or the time in his purpose is fulfilled. We never have to fear death. We are in his hands for eternity once we have laid down our life for Jesus. I go back to uh, the original story about the challenger and I just think, what if, different from my experience, they knew all the way down, this is it. We've just got moments. I just think all of us need to consider what would you do if you were them and you were going off into a blaze of history great thing everyone's watching and then all of a sudden in 73 seconds you're being thrown into the ocean that's it's difficult to imagine if if i were related to one of them that they had that experience most people say it would have been best if they wouldn't have known but we know, we know that we're going to die. We're still living. So we need to take this moment very seriously. The principles of repentance is we must recognize our sin. We must admit to ourselves that we have sinned. We must feel sorrow for our sin. We must forsake our sin. We must confess our sin. We must make restitution. We must forgive others and we must keep the commandments of God. Repentance isn't saying you're sorry, it's all of that, which can't be done in a moment. It takes, it's a little more complicated than just saying you're sorry. We are definitely living in the last days. I don't think the news is showing anywhere how fast everything's lining up. The time is coming soon when the clock is going to stop on this world and then fierce judgment is going to fall. We must do all that we can to share Jesus with our unsaved friends, family, and acquaintances because we are in that last window and God's long suffering is causing him to wait for every one last person that will repent. 
but he doesn't have to keep waiting because most people know they need to repent if they do. And you get this chance to say, okay, I'm not gonna wait any longer, or you can choose to wait again, which may be the last chance you had. Let us truly realize the truth that was spoken by British missionary C.T. Studd when he said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Precious Lord, you are far too amazing for us to even, words cannot, just my life with you is really hard to put into words and I am one of the least in the, as far as kingdom rank. But I know how amazing our lives are and how much interaction you give us with the, with both darkness and light. We get to see you in power. We get to see you defeat the enemy over and over and over. We get to see you destroy darkness. We know how powerful you are. We know our authority over the enemy. We know that you left us with everything to destroy the enemy, his work in our lives and his work in the lives of others. Help us to never take for granted everything you died for, Jesus. Help us to never take anything for granted this side of heaven that you have equipped us to do great things for the kingdom, to bring many with us. Help us not to be so selfish that we just seek to live a good good life and go to church and Bible study. Help us to understand some people will be our responsibility on that last day. We should have reached them. Our families, our friends should know. I ask you to give us a boldness, courage, and a desperation to see those we love in heaven and help us to not stop God until people abandon themselves to you. Forgive us for complacency, for apathy. I ask Holy Spirit that you would cover everyone who listens to this, that you will set them on fire, a fire that brings them to you in repentance and then a fire that blazes for the King of Kings. They would shout your name from the roof, rooftops, from the streets, that they would not stop talking about Jesus. We love you, Jesus, and we ask that you would continue to help us to see what our mission is and help us to bless you in everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.